All right. <clears throat> Passover. <clears throat> the festival that Jesus fulfilled at the cross. Yes, Christians should be celebrating this holiday. The biggest reason why so many Christians don't celebrate this holiday is because they've been taught that it's a Jewish holiday, that it's only for the Jews. And we're going to see here this morning that that's not the case at all. So let's dive into it. So we're going to jump right into this and start with Luke chapter 12, 54 through 56. Then he, then he also said to the multitudes. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean a group of people like you see in the image? Uh, no. Uh, th this was about 5,000 5, people that Yeshua was talking to when he said this, if you look at that scripture in context. And so he's making a declaration here. He's challenging them on something. Whenever you see a cloud rising out of the West, immediately you say a shower is coming, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say there'll be hot weather, and there is. Hypocrites! You can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? I want to take a look at that question right there. How is it that you do not discern this time? That question tells us what? There would be signs. Go ahead. I'm sorry. We didn't notice the signs in the seasons. Okay. Like the feast was supposed to train them to do. Okay. I think uh, Lorian tried to say something. Pretty much the same thing. Just okay. that there would be, it, it alludes that there would be signs. Okay. Yeah, well, this tells us that they should have known how to discern the times, right? Why would Jesus be asking this question if he didn't have an expectation they sh that they should know how to discern the times? What was the time that he's referring to? His coming, his arrival. They should have known how to discern those times. How would they have known that? My wife says, from, from the Bible. Bible. From the Bible, yeah, by understanding the scriptures. Brothers and sisters, read your Bibles. Let me start this morning with a challenge to this little group of ours. Don't just read your Bible to fill a 15-minute period in the morning that you call quiet time. Study it. Understand it. Learn it. And, you know, chase after little <clears throat> things that you don't understand until you come to an understanding of that which you don't understand. Yeah. Yeshua expected these people to understand their scriptures, to have known that he was the promised Messiah. All right, origins of the feast. Where do they come from? Well, it would surprise a lot of people to know that the teaching of the feast, the origin of the festivals, the same word, starts in Genesis chapter 1. In verse 14, it says, Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons, and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, and it was so. Now, any Greek Christian coming across the scripture would look at this verse and go, oh, he's, he's talking about the seasons. Uh, you know, winter, spring, fall, and summer. You know, he's talking about that. And there is some of that in there. But there's so much more in this verse when you understand the Hebrew words behind signs and seasons. The word for signs in the Hebrews is oak, and it means sign, but it's got additional meanings. Signs, omens, promised by prophets as pledges of certain predicted events. So that's awesome that this word is talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, talking about 
omens that prophets talk about of certain events. The word seasons is the word moedim. Uh, Moedim is the plural way of saying uh, seasons. It's it's moed for season and moedim for seasons. And look how it's defined. Appointed time, place, or meeting. Okay, so that's very interesting. So what does that mean? Well, that means signs, oat, and seasons, moedim, equals appointed meetings to rehearse omens or predicted events. Now, why do I say rehearse or rehearsals? Well, it's because these moedim, these, these festivals, have a different name in Scripture. And we're going to see a lot of it. Leviticus 23.1. Yehovah spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feast of Yehovah which you shall proclaim to be what? Holy convocations. These are my feasts. And by the way, the Hebrew word for feast is also moedim, the same thing as seasons. So he's calling them here in Leviticus 23, holy convocations. So it behooves us to understand what convocation means. Well, what does it look? What does it say? A convocation, a convoking, a reading. The root word kara, something called out, a public meeting, the act, the persons, or the place. Also, what? A rehearsal, an assembly, a calling, convocation, or reading. So that's why these festivals are considered to be appointed meetings appointed by who by god to practice to rehearse omens of predicted events so the seven feasts of jehovah are rehearsals of future events today we will learn how passover or pesach in hebrew unleavened bread and first fruits were rehearsals for the Passion Week of the Christ. And let's start off by asking this question. According to Leviticus 23, whose feasts are they? The Lord's. The Lord's. They are the Lord's. They're not Israel's. They're not the Jews. They're not the Greeks or the Gentiles. They are the Lord's feasts. And that's an important thing to start off with because... You've been told, and will be told again, that we don't celebrate things like this because it was only for the Jews. Well, brothers and sisters, this, this goes back to Genesis 1, long before Jews were ever on the scene. Second question is, when were they created? All the way back on day four of creation. So it's very important for us to understand that. The festivals, the spring festivals, are Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. In the middle, you have Pentecost. And in the fall feasts, you have trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. Now, today we're going to look at the first three, not so much Pentecost. The first time I taught this, the first time I taught this. Um, I did go into Pentecost, but it made for a really long lesson. We'll have to do that separately. All right. The very first Passover. Now, brothers and sisters, from this point forward, we need to pay careful attention to dates, days, and months. And as I said before we started, watch for parallels. We see the teaching of the festivals primarily in two books, Exodus and Leviticus. We'll start here in Exodus chapter 12. Now, Yehovah spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month, Nisan, shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. 
speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man <clears throat> shall take himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of persons, according to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on two of the doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire. Its head, with its legs, and its entrails, you shall let none of it remain until morning. And what remains of it until morning, you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it, with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, so you <clears throat> should eat it in haste. It is Yehovah's Passover. So what do we glean here when it comes to the dates? Well, Nisan is the first month. And on the 10th of that month, a lamb is to be chosen. And brought into the house to be kept there until the 14th of the month. Okay, so there is a four-day period of time here that this lamb is going to be with living with the family. And what, what are they doing during that time? What is the purpose of the four days? Well, it's so simple. It, it, they're going to be inspecting it. Why? Because God said it needs to be without blemish. So they're going to keep it safe. They're going to keep it sequestered, if you will, in their home where the kids start treating it like a pet and start loving it mm -hmm. and start taking care of it, inspecting it for blemishes. Mm -hmm. The specifics of this chapter, of this section of Scripture, the lamb was to be without blemish, killed at twilight, and blood on the doorposts. I don't think I have to tell you the significance of the blood on the doorposts. It's not coincidence that the way God told them to place this blood, that it forms the shape of a cross. And Exodus 12, 13 says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. I will Pesach you. Isn't that incredible? Just right out of the bag here, we start seeing these incredible connections to, to Yeshua. Because there is going to become a time when we stand before the God of creation and if he sees the blood, he will pass over us when it comes to judgment. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Leviticus 23. Remember I told you it's in Leviticus and Exodus where we see primarily the teachings of the festivals. What do we see in Leviticus 23? These are the feasts of Yehovah, holy convocations which you shall proclaim at their appointed times on the 14th day of the first month at twilight as Yehovah's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's the next holiday, the next festival. As Passover is coming to an end at the twilight, the Feast of Unleavened Bread begins at twilight. So there's this little gray area where these two holidays are kind of right next to each other seven days you must eat unleavened bread on the first day you shall have a holy convocation a sabbath 
You shall do no customary work on it, but you shall make an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. The seventh day shall also be a holy convocation, a Sabbath. You shall do no customary work on it. So in this section, we see these holy convocations are, are, or feasts are proclaimed at their appointed times. Now, this is very important. And you might feel that during the first part of this lesson, we're going over stuff we've already read. That's intentional. Uh, because as I was studying this stuff out for the first time, I had to go back over things over and over again to be reminded of the, the importance of the fact of the fact that these things are appointed times. They are scheduled times. They are prophesied times. Passover, 14th day of the first month at twilight. Unleavened bed, bread, the 15th day of the same month. Now, the first unleavened bread. Let's go look at that in, in Exodus 12. So this day, speaking of unleavened bread, shall be to you a memorial. What does that mean? That means you don't forget it. And you shall keep it as a feast to Yehovah throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread on the first day. Now, the first day of unleavened bread is when? The day after Passover. You shall remove leaven from your houses. What's leaven? Well, for them, it was flour. It was anything that that caused a rise, uh, you know, in, in the bread, so to speak. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day, there shall be a holy convocation. On the seventh day, there shall be a holy convocation for you. No manner of work shall be done on them, but that which, what, which everyone must eat, that only may be prepared by you. So you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on this same day I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Now that's important. For some reason, I don't have it highlighted. But read. let's read that again. You shall observe this festival, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, because on the same day I would have saved you from Egypt. Now, we've taught many times in this class that Egypt has always been a metaphor for the world, for us, our past, our pre-Christ experience. Mm -hmm. And so here, God is telling them that on this day, he is going to be delivering them from Egypt. And that's exactly what he did. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. In the first month, on the 14th day of this month, at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread. Until the 21st day of the, of the month, at evening, for seven days, no leaven shall be found in your houses. Since whoever eats what is leaven, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel. Whether he is a stranger or a native in the land, you shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwellings, you shall eat unleavened bread bread mm, pretty clear so what do we learn here well the dates we see again the first day the 15th the eve of passover i explained to you that little gray area where the two kind of meet is when this holiday begins and the specifics of unleavened bread leaven is <laughs> Only unleavened bread eaten seven days. Now, we've talked about this before in the past. Let's see who can recall. Uh, leaven is a metaphor for what? Sin. Sin. That's right. Leaven is a metaphor for sin. And in the Hebrew, the word for unleavened bread is matzah. We know what matzah is, right? That's a cracker with no leaven in it. And here, 1 Corinthians 5, Paul says something. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? 
Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. We are unleavened. Why? Because of what Christ did on the cross. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, what? Let us keep the feast. Let us keep the feast. How many people around you say, oh, we're never commanded to keep the feast? Yeah, you are. Right here in 1 Corinthians 5. <laughs> Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So here Paul is talking about the festival, the feast, the moed of <clears throat> unleavened bread. And we already answered this question. What is the leaven symbolic for in this verse? Sin. All right. Leviticus 23. We're going to go back and look at the first, first fruits. This is on Nisan 18. So a few days later, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land, which I give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before Yehovah to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Again, we're paying attention to dates, times. And you shall offer on that day when you wave the sheaf a male lamb of the first year without blemish as a burnt offering to Yehovah. Its grain offering shall be two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made by fire to the Lord for a sweet aroma, and its drink offering shall be of wine, one-fourth of a hin. You shall ne neither eat bread nor parched grain nor fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all of your dwellings, a statute forever. So what do we see here? First fruits of your harvest, the day after the Sabbath. It's supposed to be waved on the day after the Sabbath. Well, after which Sabbath? In this case, it would be the weekly Sabbath, and we're going to see how that unfolds in future slides. And interestingly enough, another spotless lamb is sacrificed on this day. So we have a spotless lamb being sacrificed for Passover. And four days later, we're having a, another spotless lamb sacrificed for the festival of first fruits. And what was the offering made on that day in bright red? What does it say? Fine flour mixed with oil and offering made by fire to the Lord. For a what is that? What's another way of saying that? <laughs> Bread, right? Fine. Bread and what else? Wine. Wine. Hmm. So here at the celebration or the honoring of first fruits, spotless lamb, Day after the Sabbath. Fruit of the vine. Bread yeah. and wine. Hmm. Are, are we paying attention, brothers and sisters? Are we seeing something here? Are we seeing the correlation, the connections? Amen. My son says, yep, from the other room. But I want to make sure we're tracking this prophecy together, okay? What day is Passover on? The 15th or 14th day. Let's all, say, let's all say it together. 14. 14. 14. Okay, yes. This is why I'm doing this. I want to make sure we're tracking. What day is unleavened bread on? 15. The next day. 15. Yes. And what day is first fruits on? Yes. My wife says the 18th. Okay. Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits of the their first month, the 14th, 15th, and 18th. What are the specifics of Passover? Spotless lamb is chosen, chosen four days before the 14th on the 10th to be inspected 
by the family. And then the specifics of unleavened bread is the removal of leaven from the house. The specifics of first fruits, it is the first fruits of the harvest. What harvest? Well, it would be their agricultural harvest that they're bringing the first fruits of in to the priests. It's supposed to happen the day after the Sabbath. Bread and wine. A male lamb without blemish. Lord's Supper. And the sacrifice of bread and wine. Okay, so take a snapshot of this in your mind's eye because I want you to hold on carefully to it and make sure that you are following. Is everybody following? Give me yes. a yes. Mind it. Okay. Glenn is still lost. Okay, Glenn, we'll, we'll come back around and help you if you don't, if this doesn't all make sense. Moving along. Now, <clears throat> now that we went through all that stuff, let's watch how Yeshua fulfilled the spring feasts down to the hour. But the first thing we have to start with is this. In Leviticus 25, it says, You shall count seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, seven times seven years. And the time of the seven Sabbath of years shall be to you 49 years. Then you shall cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the 10th day of the seventh month on the day of atonement you shall make the trumpet to sound throughout your land. And you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his family. That 50th year shall be a jubilee to you. In it... You shall neither sow nor reap what grows of its own accord, nor gather the grapes of your untended vine, for it is the jubilee, it shall be holy to you. What is he talking about? In the jubilee year, several significant regulations were enforced, including the release of Hebrew slaves, the return of ancestral land to its original owners, cessation of agricultural work to allow the land, the land to rest. The jubilee year, jubilee year symbolized God's provision, justice, and restoration, ensuring economic equity and social justice within the Israelite community. It served as a reminder of Israel's dependence on God and, to need, and the need to prioritize justice and compassion in societal structures. So do you see anything familiar here? The Jubilee goes by another name in scripture. Anybody know what that is? Basically, this is a time where all debts were canceled. Everything borrowed was returned to its owner. Every slave was freed. It was a year of Jubilee where everything goes back to the way it was all debts are canceled and it goes by another name in scripture isaiah 61 spirit of the lord god is upon me because the lord has appointed me to preach good tidings to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's another name. Why is it the acceptable year of the Lord? Why is that year so important? Because just as I said, everything, even the land itself, is set free from captivity. Everything is returned to its rightful owner. Slaves are set free. Work is ceased. And people return mm -hmm. to their families. And Jesus says in Revelation 21.5, mm -hmm. 
Behold, mm. I make all things new. Now, did that verse in Isaiah 61 sound familiar? It should have. Yeah, because that's what Jesus read, um, you know, on yeah. the Sabbath. In Luke, 4, in Luke 4, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. Hmm. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the jubilee, the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. Gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, "Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing." What does that mean? Jesus began his ministry on the day of jubilee, when all the captives are set free, when all the slaves are freed, when everything goes back to the way it was, because he makes all things new. And this is where his ministry began. So it's important for us to understand that as we go in to how he fulfilled the Passover. Okay, let's start breaking down our specifics. One of the specifics we saw in Exodus in Leviticus was what? That four days before the 14th, on the 10th, a lamb was to be chosen. John chapter 12, verse 1. Then, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead whom he had raised from the dead, and there they made him a supper. Very innocent little scripture, but if you're not paying attention to dates, times, months, seasons, and appointed times, you might read right over and go, okay, big deal. But when is Passover? 14th. The 14th. Six days before is? Eight. The eighth going into the ninth. What do I mean by that? Well, you have to remember in the Hebrew calendar, the new day begins at sundown, right? If it's not the, the Greco Roman calendar that we all have, where uh, the, the 24 hour period is from midnight to midnight. No, in the Hebrew calendar, a new day starts when the sun goes down. So, Wednesday morning, so to speak, could very well mean Tuesday night. Okay? So the 8th going into the ninth. John 12, a few verses later. The next day, a great multitude had come to the feast when they heard that Yeshua was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Okay, so here we go, another scripture that says the next day. What would the next day have been? The ninth nice. into the tenth. What happens on the 10th? The lamb's brought in. The lamb is selected and kept for four days to expect for blemishes. So here we see Yeshua already fulfilling the prophecy built into the festivals of this lamb being selected prior to the Passover 
and inspected for four days. Remember, at the same time, the rest of Israel was preparing for the national Passover. And the lamb was kept within the temple complex <clears throat> to ensure its condition by the time of the Passover. Remember I said that the reason for sequestering the lamb in the home was to do the very same thing, was to protect the lamb for that time period. Well, the national Passover is going on. And at the very same time that Yeshua is being ushered into the temple, they are also bringing the national four-legged lamb into the temple complex to ensure its condition by the time of Passover. So as Yeshua is being ushered through the east gate by people yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna, at the very same time, there's something going on through a different gate. What's the name of this gate? We looked at it last week. It depends. Is this the Mifkad one? Or? This is the Sheep Gate. This is the Sheep Gate. So as I'm a priest and I'm walking through this gate, there's commotion happening to the left side of me at the East Gate. So at the same time, we have Yeshua entering into the East Gate and the National Passover Lamb entering through the Sheep Gate. Now, that's a striking picture. Why? For a couple of reasons. The people singing Hosanna to Yeshua are also singing over at the National Lamb Entry. We have two celebrations kind of going on here. And it's an ironic scene. Because those who truly knew who Yeshua was was with Yeshua. And those who didn't was with the priest and his bunch bringing in the national Passover lamb. It's, it's a reenactment, if you will, of the virgins, some prepared and some not. It's a reenactment of those who understand their scriptures and those who don't. It's an incredible irony. And then we have this. We all know what this is, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus clearing out the temple. When did this happen? Well, according to Matthew, this happened right after he entered the temple on the donkey. So he gets brought into the temple. They're singing Hosanna. He's riding a donkey. And he goes straight into the temple complex and starts cracking whips and turning over tables. John 2. Now what? The Passover of the Jews was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, the money changers doing business. He had made a whip of cords. He drove them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the changers' uh, money and overturned the te temple tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these away! Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. Some of your Bibles will say consumed me. Zeal for your house has consumed me. Why did Yeshua do this? Clean the leaven out of the temple. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. He had to cleanse his house of leaven. Just like the scripture says. And what is leaven? Sin. Yeah. And so he goes in here and he sees all these money changers, all these people doing things for themselves. And he got busy. 
And so some people will look at this and go, oh, well, here we have a unique opportunity to see Jesus' human side. No, you don't. This isn't Jesus' human wrath coming out. He's dealing with sin. And this is how he gets the leaven out of his father's house. Do you see? Ed, quick question. Yes. Um, John calls the Passover the Jewish Passover. Yeah, that's there's a whole there's a whole nother um discussion there, David. There there's a lot of debate about that verse for a real good reason that we really don't have time to go over now. Uh, but we will, we can in the future. That's a great, that's a great uh, observation. Uh inspection of the lamb. That's one of the particulars, right? Of Passover. Was Yeshua inspected? Mm -hmm. He had to be, right? Yes. Yeah. Mark 12. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to do what? Catch him in his words. Mark 14. After two days, it was what? The Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death inspecting him Matthew 26 now the chief priests <laughs> elders and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death but what no. found none every though even though many false witnesses came forward they found none and my favorite Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowd I find no fault in this man he was without blemish. He was without blemish. Just like Exodus 12, 5 says. No lamb shall be without blemish. First fruits. How did he fulfill first fruits? The waving of the sheath three days later. Matthew 28, 1. The Bible says, now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary and Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. This was after Yeshua had been buried. That it's important for us to note there what after the Sabbath means, Matthew 28, 1. Remember Leviticus said, he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf on the day after the Sabbath. The priest shall wave it. So here, Mary, on the day after the Sabbath, goes to see the tomb. And what's happened? It's empty. Yeshua has risen. Why? Because Paul says he has become the what? the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He was the first resurrection of many who will someday be resurrected to life because of their faith in Christ. So here, three days later, he is fulfilling the requirements of first fruits. Say he became the fruits. Yes. So Western Christianity uses that day, the first day, as a time to assemble when actually it was just fulfilling prophecy of the festivals. That's correct. That's yeah. crazy. Somebody well, else has a question? If Jesus was the first to be resurrected. <clears throat> what are they calling what happened to Lazarus? Uh, just he rose from the dead. It was a miracle. But the first fruits of the resurrection, resurrected. the first fruits of the resurrection that's spoken of uh, by so many in the scriptures is a reference to the ultimate resurrection of those who are asleep. Many people who are dead right now, who are in Christ, will someday be risen to life and be given their new body and their new robes. 
Yeshua was the first person. Lazarus, yeah, he was raised from the dead as a miracle, but he went on living the rest of his life and died again <laughs> eventually. So he was the first fruits of the resurrection. All right, tracking the prophecy. What is Passover? The 14th. Spotless lamb is chosen four days before. On the 10th, he's inspected four days. He's killed at twilight. Unleavened bread is when? Next day. It's a removal of leaven from the house. No unleavened bread eaten. When his first fruits, three days later, <coughs> first fruits of the harvest, day after the Sabbath, and a male lamb without blemish. Isn't that interesting? We have, we've got to cover that. Because a male lamb without blemish went into the tomb. And a male lamb without blemish rose from the dead. Do you see? In a sacrifice of bread and wine. That's why at Passover we share bread and wine together. Passover unleavened bread and first fruits is a celebration of, but for Israel was a rehearsal of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. This is what they were rehearsing for 1,500 years before the day came, which takes us all the way back to our opening slide, where Yeshua challenged the people for not seeing, for not knowing, for not being able to discern the times of these events. For 1,500 years, the people of Israel celebrated these three holidays of the Lord as rehearsals for what would eventually come. For what was prophesied within the feasts themselves. And if this is true, and it is, how much attention should we give the fall feasts which prophesy his second coming? If you are trying to figure out the details of the second coming of Christ without understanding the festivals, you are blinded. You are going to miss many, many things. Brothers and sisters, it was understanding this, that it first, eight years ago, first made me stop in my tracks and go, wait a minute. The teaching of the festivals is in which two books primarily? Leviticus and Genesis. Exodus and Leviticus. Right? In my mind, I started thinking to myself, now wait a minute. That's the law. That's the Old Testament law. You're telling me that Leviticus has prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled? Yes. If that's true, then how can it be dead? How can the Old Testament be null and void if Leviticus still has prophecies yet to be fulfilled in the second coming of Christ? Yeah. yeah. Matthew 5 says that everything stands until it is all fulfilled and it hasn't all been fulfilled. That's correct. <laughs> and so it was this understanding, brothers and sisters, that sent me down my path that I'm that I'm on now. And I want to take just a, a few steps more. The Lord's Supper, as we know it, is not the communion that we've all grown up taking, some of us every week, 
at church, the bread and the wine. Luke 22. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. Now, why? That's kind of an interesting statement right there. But if you remember, the the killing of the lamb happens at twilight. It happens during that gray period when Passover is ending and unleavened bread is starting. And he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. So they said to him, where do you want us to prepare? And he said, behold, when you've entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Then he shall say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished upper room there make ready. So they went out and found it just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, he sat down with the 12 apostles with him, and he said to them with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. What's happening here? Is this communion? Or is this Passover? Mm -hmm. What's not happening here? Not remembering the death. The Christian church loves to turn to passages like this all the time and say, see here, it's communion. No, it's not. No, well, they're referring to Paul when they talk about communion. Oh, no, they're referring to Jesus as well. In the synoptic gospels. When Jesus is breaking bread and wine with his guys, they call it his communion. Matter of fact, in your Bible, if you look right now, it'll say the title that Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. Yeah. Okay, no. What they were doing was honoring Passover. It's not the communion. In fact, the word communion does not even appear in the original Greek text of the New Testament. Nowhere. And for fun, I thought I'd show you, if you do a search for the word communion in your Bible concordance, you'll find two or three verses. Here's one of them from 1 Corinthians 10, 16. Therefore, my beloved, feel free, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing, which we bless, is it not the what? The communion of the blood of Christ? See that little blue E next to that word? You go down to the bottom and find the, the letter E, and what is the word? Fellowship. Nope. It's not communion. It's fellowship. And the same goes just a few words later where he talks about the communion of the body of Christ. The word is also fellowship. Like one might say, the fellowship of the ring. This is the fellowship of the blood. This is the fellowship of the body of Christ. Not the communion. The, the Christian church created the communion. The Catholic church created the communion. And Christian church has followed along for 2,000 years. My wife wanted to see this. I had originally included it in the lesson. Uh, just because it takes a lot of time to go through it. But she thought it was important that we understand which day Yeshua was crucified on. Traditionally, in the Christian church, they want to tell us that it happened on Friday night. Well, there's just no possible way you can fit three days and three nights into the weekend to have Yeshua being resurrected on Sunday. Remembering the white lines represent our 24-hour 
Western Greco calendar, Roman calendar, and the black lines represent the Hebrew calendar of uh, when the day begins. So if you look at that, you can see up on top, Nissan 14 would have been from Wednesday evening to Thursday evening, where Yeshua was eventually died. I have the cross at 9 a.m. because that's how long he was on the cross. And then Nissan 15, which was the unleavened bread, starts at twilight on Thursday. And what a lot of people forget is what the Bible says in Leviticus 23, that you're supposed to have a holy convocation, a Sabbath, uh, after that holiday. And so they what they don't realize is that there were two Sabbaths that week. There was the one built into the festivals, and then there was the weekly Sabbath on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And that's where people get messed up because there were two preparation days and two Sabbaths. Mm. So this may help some, it may not others, uh, but uh, my wife thought it would be interesting to, to show that. I think, I think what we're wrestling with that is what are our like, requirements as we head into this season? Like, what is, like, I don't think we're yeah, taking a that's, land. That's, that's a great question. So but basically, how does a believer today honor this holiday? Well, good news is you don't have to sacrifice a lamb. Amen. Uh, why? Well, because Yeshua was the final sacrifice, right? Mm -hmm. For for those of us who are in faith. Hebrews, yeah. Um, what, I, what we do in our celebration of Passover is we'll have a gathering of people in our home. Um We'll enjoy one another's fellowship. I'll usually teach something that goes for 10 to 15 minutes, a very condensed version of what you guys saw this morning. And then we'll 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 pray and we'll eat. Some years we've done what's called a Seder, which is a very traditional process, way of eating certain things. If you recall, the scriptures mentioned uh bitter herbs and, and other things um so we've done that in the past just so that we could experience the richness of that tradition um other times we've we've just talked about how yeshua fulfilled this festival and how he was mm -hmm. the spotless lamb um and then and then have a meal together so you can do it one of two ways you can have a, a longer <clears throat> drawn out more traditional Seder service, or you can have a very simple time of just remembering what Yeshua did on the cross and how he was the Passover lamb. Better, better person to answer that might be David because he, I think he does. Don't you do a full Seder, David? Yeah, and, and thanks, um, thanks, Eric, for asking. That's a great question, and I've myself also have gone a little bit back and forth. At least in my mind, we've we've customarily done the the more. Jewish traditional um, Seder, Passover uh, meal. Uh, part of it maybe is because that's what I grew up with. And the tradition is like Ed said, kind of to share the richness of the tradition. It's very structured, uh, but it definitely does cover a lot of the things that if you read in Exodus 12, it talks about the fact that you have to eat it with, you know, you have to eat bitter herbs. And so there's a lot of symbolism built into that uh celebration and so we do follow it i have debated in my head like well but i know that jesus didn't celebrate it this way right so why am i doing it exactly that way so i kind of go back and forth in my head i'm still not clear exactly what i'm going to do this year um we'll, we'll have a couple more weeks to make that decision we are we are hosting one uh again um what i do want to also emphasize and this is very important and it, and we read about this in, in exodus 12 is that this has to be it, you remember just like any celebration that this is a family event and most importantly it's very critical for the children to participate 
yeah. because it says there that this is, first of all, he oh, said gosh. it's supposed to be a memorial, right? It's supposed to be something that we remember for generations. And in, if you keep on reading in Exodus 12, it says, and when your son asks, why are we doing this? He says, well, because our father took us out of Egypt with an outstretched arm and a, and a strong hand, right? Mm -hmm. So it's very critical that the children be engaged with this. And there are pieces of the Jewish traditional uh, Passover Seder that the kids are actually involved. They do different things and they're part of the uh, they're part of the whole celebration, right? And so it's it's etched in their memory, like, okay, this was passed on to my children, and this is how this perpetuates and lives on to this day, right? Otherwise, if they didn't celebrate it every year, you know, I've had some people say, well, I did a Seder once. So they think, you know, I did it once, I checked the box, I don't have to do it again. But, you know, what happens if you do something only once? Eventually you forget about it, right? The idea is to be remembering this every single year, for generations, forever, so that we can be standing here today, 2,000 years after Jesus, and still remember and talk about the sacrifice that he made, and, and 3,000 years, however long Egypt was, and talk about how great the God that we worship, the things that he did, the miracles that he did in Egypt, right? A big part of also the whole uh, Passover Seder for in, in the Jewish tradition is the foretelling of what happened in Egypt and the plagues and what happened with you know going through the Dead Sea and all the miracles that Jesus that God did during that time again to bring to light to this current generation who's living on you know iPhones and Xboxes to tell them okay but there's a God and this God these is incredible things that are bigger than what you see on an Xbox right he does these amazing miracles that's the God that we worship mm -hmm. and we need to be reminded both as adults and, and also the future generations that this is the God the type of God that we worship that really cares about us that is willing to make this sacrifice and then as Christians you know, what I've done in my Passover is, is I did the Jewish traditional thing, but then I also overlaid on top of it, similar to what Ed was talking about right now, the 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 dimension of Jesus and how Jesus fulfills. I, I didn't get into all the details of the days and that kind of stuff, but definitely talked about how Jesus is our Passover lamb. He was without blemish. He was sacrificed. And how as Christians, in the same way that the Jews were delivered from bondage and uh from Egypt and they left Egypt in the same way we as Christians uh, are delivered from the bondage of sin through the sacrifice of the unblemished lamb during Passover, during the exact same time, right? So so it's kind of a, a hybrid or a tiered kind of way that we celebrate it as we show the Jewish part and then we layer on top of it, okay, this is how Jesus fulfilled this and how the, um, how the, New Testament is the fulfillment, right, of how it's showing how it's happening. But again, you know, not fulfillment like it has to be one and done type of thing. It's something that even if it was done once, right, there's only one sacrifice, it's over. We still need to remember it every year. If we don't remember it every year, we're going to forget it, right? And we're not, and, and our children are never going to learn about it. And eventually this thing is just going to be, you know, going away. But also wanted to also clarify for those of you who may be new, uh, what Yeshua did with his guys was not a Seder. Uh, tr traditionally, um, uh, what I should say, I shouldn't use the word traditionally, I should mean historically, what they would have done was have a meal together as a family <clears throat> after making the sacrifice uh, uh, of the lamb. And then, you know, having the bitter herbs on the table and that kind of stuff. And they would talk about, just like David said, talk about its meaning. Uh, the Seder came along a little later on where it's a, a much more extravagant, you know, event and can sometimes take hours if you do a full Seder. Uh, that's that's not necessary. You don't have to do those things. Yeah, You should do it once just, just, to, just to see what's involved. When you sit down and do a real Seder, it's amazing, the parallels. They just jump off the screen to you, off the screen, out of the page uh, to you. But it's not necessary question something that hasn't been mentioned is the feast of unleavened bread where it says it's a holy convocation like that is that's lost in all of this no the feast of unleavened bread if you recall is a time where we get leaven out of our lives now why why are we doing that why are we getting leaven out of our house why do we as david said 
set up a game for the kids to go and look for leaven. Um, Cause they would do that. You know, when you cook in your home for a year, you'd be surprised when you pull your oven back and look in certain crevices of your house, you've got little piles of flour and stuff that you've, or pancake mix that you've dropped. You know, it's, it gets everywhere. And, and what does leaven represent? Well, rubber leaven represents sin. And so when God says to eat leaven, unleavened bread for seven days and to get the leaven out of your house, what is the parallel? He's trying to teach us that that's a time where we focus on ridding ourselves of sin. For many people during the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread for that seven days, they're praying about their sin. They're confessing sin. They're getting sin out. Um, and as a practice, I will get all the leaven out of my house. Yeah. Every pancake mix, every waffle, every... Anything that's got flour in it, I'll pack it up and go toss it in the garage and sometimes just throw it away. Yeah. Uh, you know, so that's what unleavened bread teaches us. In Israel, actually, uh, you go to supermarkets and stuff like that. The whole bread section is covered mm -hmm. over. It's empty. I mean, you can't buy it like in... Well, you can't buy it in the main supermarkets. There, obviously, you can buy anything. You can find a place if you really wanted to, but generally speaking, in it the majority of the wow. places, you can't. I mean, it's funny, even even like falafel, everybody I'm sure knows what falafel is, and you eat falafel inside of a pita. Ooh. During Passover, you'll eat it in a wet matzah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> a, it's, it's an interesting, interesting. Uh, and there's a lot of creative ways, you know, we're talking about, unleavened bread there's a lot of creative ways to to use the matzah and make it with eggs and put nutella and i just saw a recipe for chocolate, Lugonia using chocolate matzah. spread and all kinds of interesting stuff so they get really creative and you know during yeah. that so you matzah. guys sit seder on that the, on the, a second seder too then the what Say again Will you do a second Seder too? Or do you just get together? Because it says it's a holy convocation. So like, do you get together with other families on the... On the, on the second on the second one no but on the first, first one, one i mean on the first on the on the passover night we do it that's when the yeah. celebration is the second one is a sabbath right if you will or it's supposed to be a day of rest do not do any work uh but there's no a big celebration again on the second one but that brings that, an interesting yeah. point lauren because um we all grew up in churches that tell us that uh, Sunday and Wednesday and midweek Bible study are all meetings of the body. Yeah, they're not. And they're not. Um, here, the, the festivals were the meetings of the body for Israel. Those were holy gatherings. Those were holy okay. convocations. The weekly they, Sabbaths as well. As well as the Sabbath, correct. The Sabbath is a holy convocation. So, God gets to tell us what a meeting of the body is. We don't need, we don't get to invent them. Amen. And they did. the Christian church did invent them yep. with their own. They started calling a, a midweek service. That's a meeting of the body. You need to be there. Okay. Right. And we did. But, well, I'm not going off of what like we do as a, you know, perhaps evangelical church. So there was a scripture. I didn't write it down. I have to revisit it where it said that the, the day after Passover, the feast, the first night of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a holy convocation. Like it's a day where it I is. forget the scripture. Yeah, I, I, I think that was Exodus 12 that we read. And it is. And David just said, so Passover, there's Passover. Mm -hmm. just imagine a box, that's Passover. The next day is two things. It's unleavened bread and it's a Sabbath. Mm -hmm. uh, Sabbath is also called holy convocation. Mm -hmm. okay so the weekly gathering is a holy convocation or a sabbath built into a festival is a holy yeah. convocation okay so yeah that clarifies that yes now, I hey i was going to just add something yes. um uh, when we were growing up in san antonio when passover came the way my mother would get rid of the leaven we didn't really completely get rid of it she would move everything we clean all take everything out of the cabinets and clean everything up and then she would move all the tray from the 
11 to the top shelf and cover it. And then she would, all the other shelves were bare and she would put like, I guess, parchment paper or wax paper or something there and then put the Passover food there. And that's how we did the week. And we actually usually celebrate it both nights, the first and second night. The first night might be at a friend's house. The second night might be at our house. And, you know, my mother was raised Orthodox, but we were far from that. So, yeah, we, we, I this, guess, is when, this is Wendy all. She's yeah, a Wendy. friend from Houston. Hello, Wendy. Our so sister. one thing I just wanted to encourage you all with is this. <clears throat> uh, you're, you're not going to fully embrace these festivals initially. Um, it took me, and it's still taking me time. I've been on this path now for eight years, and I'm still trying to fully embrace these things in my life and to, to make sure that they're they're done timely and properly. So let's just assume for the moment this is the first time you've heard of this. You're gonna you're gonna mess up. The first time you try to do your own Passover or your own uh, feast of trumpets or whatever, it's just it's you. You are. Don't don't get caught up in the mistakes you're making. Don't get caught up in not doing it just right. I believe in my heart that God is pleased that your attention is even being given yeah. to this, and when you do give it to it your understanding will continue to grow and your appreciation for these things. And like I said, the richness of, uh, and the truth of these festivals that all talk about Jesus will, will really help change your, your life. Amen. So Ed. Yeah. So Monday being the Passover on the 22nd, the next day is the start of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is actually the Holy Convocation. Uh, let me pull it up on a calendar, Glenn. I don't, I don't, let me see here. So, yeah. So, yeah. Passover is the 22nd, 22nd this year? 22nd. 22nd. Um, so, that's a Monday, right? So, the next day is the Holy Convocation. Next day is a Sabbath, and it's also the first day of Unleavened Bread. So I need to take that day off from work. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, that's another thing, Glenn. As I started coming into this understanding scripturally, I, 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 I can't tell you how many times, probably for, for the first two or three years, I let myself get, I, I, I missed it. I was like, yeah. oh my gosh, there's an there's a Sabbath today, you know, and I had already scheduled a day's worth of work. Yeah. So that's right. going to happen too. You know, you're, you're this, this kind of stuff you have to, you have to make a mind <laughs> shift yeah. from, from all things Greek to all things godly, you know, and, and it's not, it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. Right. But so it's clear, I'm sorry. Go it's, ahead. Uh, it's sundown Monday would be Passover. Sundown Tuesday would be the first day of a mother bed. So technically, Glenn, you'd be taking Tuesday and Wednesday off of work. Well, just Wednesday. The night, so be Wednesday. Night. Wednesday would be the, well. Yeah. Um, real, while you guys are working that out, I'd like to hear Eric's thoughts. <laughs> you're, you're, you're muted. There you go. I, I enjoyed the, the whole sermon. It was awesome. Good. Okay. Any any thoughts mm -hmm. on the on what we're talking about? Or are you just well, uh, absorbing? I'm just absorbing. This is uh, this is the first time I've heard it taught this way. So it was awesome. Well, good, good. Thank you. I'm glad you're here. Me too. I'm glad to have another Eric. Just personally. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> what? I'm oh, glad to have another <laughs> Eric. Yeah. yeah, when I was first studying the Bible. This is the passage that convinced me that everything made sense now. Because look how many times Jesus had went to the temple. Mm -hmm. Why didn't he get irate and, and turn over the money tables any other time he went there? 
because it wasn't time. And yeah. that's when the light came on and I said, oh my gosh, mm. everything is planned out. Yeah. Amen, Eva. Uh, what about Nasser? Nasser, are you there? You've been with us? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I've been observing and listening much like Eric. Sorry, my hair is insane right now. But um, yeah, I've been really enjoying this a lot, actually, because uh, I just got baptized in November. Oh, so awesome. I've just been trying to I actually texted uh, Garrett, um, your son. Uh, I'm friends with him. And I was like, I really just want to start learning more about like the faith because it's great that I'm going to church and stuff like that. But I want to know a little bit more about the background of it. Um, and this was a great great introduction honestly like um, i never heard it taught like this in depth and like just the graphics that you brought um just like made it very digestible now i did want to ask like so is the passover technically just um in when it was going when it happened like you know back when jesus was here um was it a meal that he had like what exactly was like the passover exactly you know yeah. Passover exactly was a sacrificed goat or sheep. Got it. Okay. That that's what was commanded yeah. back in Exodus twelve. Yeah, and then they yeah. had a meal. And they, just like it's, it's a it's a replaying of what happened, or God's command is to observe what was done in 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 Egypt, right? You mm -hmm. have them built together. You eat the lamb. Yep. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Got it. No, absolutely. Yeah, that makes sense. And now everything is kind of coming together with that. So it's like it's the whole it's that whole ceremony that was the Passover. Yes. Right. And now we have we gather and we have meals with our families or like you mentioned, the satyrs. And that's kind of the way that we can remember it and yes. celebrate tradition. Right. Yes. Yeah, that's a great okay. question, because uh, the Israelites were commanded uh, in the Old Testament to honor the celebration of Passover by remembering what God did for them by taking them out of Egypt, saving them from Egypt. Mm -hmm. Our Passover lamb, the true Passover lamb being Jesus, said, do this in remembrance of me. Why? Because just like the Father took Israel out of Egypt, so Jesus takes us out of our Egypt, mm -hmm. faith in him, takes us out of the world, out of our past sins, where we were held captive, like Israel was held captive in Egypt. We are held captive by our sin that his death, burial, and resurrection now frees us from. So do this in remembrance of me. Now, when I celebrate Passover, I am doing that in remembrance of Christ while not forgetting what God did for Israel in Egypt. That's the point. It's not one that supersedes, right, or replaces. I'm using these terms and purpose. It doesn't supersede or replace what happened in Egypt. It's in addition or foretelling if you you know the initial one is a foretelling of what's going to happen doesn't cancel or negate of what originally happened right and it's still the same god that we worship and he is still almighty and powerful as he was there in the days of egypt right yeah. so we are honoring the amazing god that we worship Amen. Uh, by what he did in the past and then what was done again right proving it again uh, with the sacrifice of Jesus, right? So it's, it's multiple stories now mm -hmm. that you can tell. The, Jew, the Israelites were say, tell the story of Egypt, and now we're telling the story of Egypt because, you know, we all we all agree that this is one book. We still look at the at what happened to, you know, we, we learn about God and how we should behave from the Old Testament. It's still part of our faith, right? So we still celebrate that. But now we're adding on to uh, that the additional celebration of Jesus mm -hmm. and how those things are connected. It just, I, I think, mm -hmm. you know, to me, it builds my faith and it just, it, you know, uh, just increases my 
awe of God, right? Yeah. And of how the whole thing is planned and how this, all these things happen and how they're all so interconnected and how, just like, uh, you know, Jesus was saying at the beginning in the way, uh, the way that, uh, that uh, um, Ed showed at the beginning, is like, couldn't you, couldn't you tell? It's like just encouraging us again to go back into the Old Testament to see how Jesus is foretold mm -hmm. throughout the whole Old Testament, the old, old Bible. Uh, now, the, the thing is that part of it has to be that there has to be some element of revelation here because as Wendy, as myself that grew up as Jews, as the same as the Jews themselves that even walked with Jesus, they knew their Bibles and they still didn't make the connections. Right. And we see the story and look, you know, in uh, Luke, uh, the road to Emmaus, Luke 22. And, and he says he opened their eyes and he started showing them about all that was talked about him in the laws and the prophets, right? Mm -hmm. So God uses situations like this. God uses Ed and other people as well to kind of open our eyes and to reveal to us these connections, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The New Testament doesn't come out of nowhere. It's built on a solid foundation of the Old Testament. And, and it's it's mm -hmm. the fulfillment, it's the accomplishment, if you will, of uh, these, these foretellings that were established in the Old Testament. So you can't know about Jesus or fully understand Jesus and the New Testament without truly understanding the background that's in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Got it. Tell me, what about you? Well, I feel like I'm going back to college. <laughs> oh. This has been very interesting. Yes, you know, we, I mean, I've been a disciple for over 20 years and I have read the Bible many times in different versions, but uh, uh, you are bringing me in a new level of comprehension of uh, a God's word. Mm. Amen. Yeah. It's been great. Thank Amen. you. Amen. Well, anybody else that I haven't picked on? Garrett, are you still? Un unmute yourself and share anything you want to share. No, I uh, I, I appreciated the, the clearing up on communion. That's something that has been on the back burner for me to clear up in my own learning and being able to see that it isn't something that we need to engage in weekly, but on a specific day um, has just been another, I guess, piece of the fog that's been cleared up. So I appreciate that. Amen. Sandra, you've been awfully quiet. Well, you're, you're, there you go. thought it was awesome. I, um, I learned a lot, but I also have your book and I've gone through that a few times. Um, to see the how he was inspected for blemish that uh, and he um, and Jesus the inspection of the lamb and the removal of the leaven and and when he cleansed the temple and that was mm. removing the le leaven I just had never really connected that until until this teaching and and reading your book it was very helpful ma'am when my eyes were open to, to the feast days was during Passover a couple years ago that my son did. And we did a, a short Seder. And it wasn't just myself. It was my older son, Jason, and his wife, too. That It was just so amazing that we just saw it and knew we were going to keep the feast from that time forward. Amen. The law was not abolished. and that it was important and um, we've been pursuing it. So I'm having Passover with my eldest son in Missouri this year. Oh, cool. A couple weeks. Yeah, looking forward to that. Amen. Go ahead. Go ahead, Joe. We did the Seder last year for the first time and uh, we were not fully prepared. So we were following the sheet of, you know, what took place. But our children still today still talk about it and how much fun it was to search for the unleavened 
uh, flour and eating the horseradish and, you know, all the things that we did, it was really, it's very eye-opening about how they, you know, they do retain those things and how important that is Mm -hmm. for all of us. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you very much for your teaching today. Yeah, growing up. Yeah, it was those are some of my best memories, those Passover Seders. So Oh, amen. Thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna much. be reading over my notes a few times. <laughs> and we're so happy that you're here. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, to all of our newbies here too. Nasser, thank you so much for coming. Eric, that's great to see you. Um uh let's let's I, I'm sorry for going long. I knew we'd probably go a little long today, but it is Passover. If you have any questions, just shoot me a text. I can answer. David can answer. Um, but guys, have a great Shabbat. Have a great weekend. And um, we'll, we'll maybe Glenn, you can close us in just a, a quick word of prayer here. Okay. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now and just in your glory and to thank you for all you've done for us and thank you for how you've prepared the way through our our um, brothers and sisters throughout the path. And thank you so much that uh, we could learn of the Passover and just the correlation to our Lord uh, dying and being put in the tomb and raising again. And uh, thank you for Ed and how you use him. And thank you for all the brothers and sisters that are here today. And we pray that we have a great Shabbat. We praise the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. You have a great day. Love you guys. Bye bye. Bye.